reading the, the book of Esther is more fascinating to me than watching the film adaptation of the book. But I'm sure many uh, young people today would, would disagree with me. For example, several of my uh, students would prefer to see the film first, and then when they are interested enough, uh, they would proceed to reading their Bible, uh, uh, the book of Esther in, in their Bible. And when they are watching the film, the boys are always distracted of how beautiful the actress for um, Queen Esther is compared to Queen Vashti. And of course, the girls are also distracted of how ugly and clumsy the actor for uh, King Xerxes uh, is. But after watching an Esther film, you always get that impression and, and ask, is that really how it happened? Uh, was Esther really like that? Or was uh, King Xerxes was really like that? That's why I think that only the, the written text in the Bible can do justice to this great historical book. No film, no movie can ever capture the true beauty of Esther, the great power and wealth of King Xerxes, and no movie can portray the, the vast and enormous empire of ancient Persia and Media. It is only when you read the text in the Bible that you can truly feel the pain and agony of Mordecai, the pride and jealousy of Haman, the burst of anger of Xerxes, and the sorrow and anguish of the Jews in the face of death and destruction. The book of Esther is one of the few works of ancient literature that is very well written. It is even admired by those who are not believers to the God of the Jews and the God of Christians. Maybe because it is a complete story containing romance, drama, suspense, and it's also a book of comedy because of the, the twists and, and the turns of the, the plot. But most of all, the story captured the imagination of, of many people because it is a story of a simple and unknown Jewish girl who rose to a royal position and was instrumental to save thousands of Jews from a mass murder. The name and beauty of Esther now stand among other women in ancient literature whose beauty is remembered until today. Names like Helen of Troy, Queen Nefertiri of Egypt, and Cleopatra of the Ptolemaic Empire. The story of Esther happened around 100 years after the, the Jewish exile. The exile when King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, destroyed Judah and transported thousands of Jews to Babylon. And many years after that exile, Babylon was replaced with another world power, another kingdom. It was defeated by Persia. And Cyrus, the king of Persia, issued a decree, a new law, that would allow the captured Jews and their families to go home to Palestine and rebuild their country, to rebuild uh, the one that Nebuchadnezzar destroyed. The exile was predicted by many prophets, including uh, Habakkuk, uh, which was uh, uh, preached to us by uh, Pastor Nick. Also, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah at the end of, near the end of the Old Testament, describe the story of the Jews who went home. They were allowed to go home by Cyrus. They went home to Palestine, the promised land. They rebuilt the Jewish temple, repaired the walls of Jerusalem, and they restored their homes. But on the other side of the world, 
The story of Esther is the story of those Jews who decided to stay in Persia. They did not go home. They decided to stay in Persia. Yes, many of them were disobedient for staying, for not going home to the promised land. But some of them stayed for good reasons, like Mordecai and his young cousin Hadassah, which is also known as Esther. It is true that God's name is not mentioned in this book. But God actually is the main character of the story, or the, the invisible director of the whole show. Esther and Mordecai were only instruments of his care and protection for the Jewish nation. The story of, of Esther contains so many positive coincidences or a series of fortunate events that you can say no one but God alone can do in, in a pagan kingdom like Persia. For example, Esther, a Jewish girl, happened to be selected as a replacement of Queen Vashti. Mordecai, his, her uncle, happened to discover the plan to assassinate the king. King Xerxes happened to have insomnia on the night before Haman planned to kill Mordecai. And the royal chronicles that was read to the king at that night happened to contain the report of Mordecai's good deed. So the careful reader of the Old Testament would begin to think, are these just coincidences? Or is there someone behind all of these events? That is why the verse in chapter 4, verse 14, captures that, that very question. Who knows? Who knows but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this? Those words were spoken by Mordecai to Esther, his adopted cousin. The question also made Esther wonder to what purpose, to what end was she made queen? And the powerful expression for such a time as this describes a time of, of crisis, a time of danger, a time of pain and impending suffering. What role will Esther play now that she is in a position of influence and power? What will she do knowing that his people are facing a huge and deadly crisis. As I read the, the story of Esther several times this week, I come to realize that our time today, today, is very similar to the time of Esther. I also come to realize that our position today in the kingdom of God is similar to Esther's position in ancient Persia. Let me now share to you my reflections on our time as I also reflected on the time of Esther. We must also look at this story in light of New Testament message. First one, similar to Esther's day, we live in a time when death is a constant threat. When death is a constant threat. The evil Haman plan to, in chapter 3, verse 13, he planned to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and little children, on a single day. Haman's plan to annihilate the Jews could have been the first Jewish Holocaust. It could have been worse than the destruction of Judah by the Babylonians a hundred years past. If Haman's plan succeeded and all Jews were killed, there would have been no New Testament in our Bibles and Christ would have not been 
born. Today, all over the world, people are dying every minute, whether by a disease or by COVID or by some unnatural cause. We heard the news that happened in Morocco. Uh, a terrible earthquake has just struck Morocco. And latest data from the World Health Organization says that since the outbreak, COVID has now killed 6.9 million people around the world. But regardless of all these statistics on the cause of death, the real death in the world is 100%. That means that everyone dies one way or another. Like the Jews in Esther's day, we can face death any moment, regardless of our position or status in life. Young or old, rich or poor, vaccinated or not, whether you have an, a health insurance or, or, or not, we all die. As followers of Jesus, we need a, a fresh and, and realistic attitude towards death. According to one classic author, blessed is the one who keeps the moment of death ever before his eyes and prepares for it every day. We often forget that this world is not our permanent home. When we reach a, a certain level of a standard of living, it is tempting to think that life is so good down here. So we, we promise ourselves to live very long instead of living very well. We become so attached to the things that we do, to the things that we own, that we forget where our true home really is. When we see a, a person die, whether in real life or in the news, we can remind ourselves that sooner or later, I too will leave this world. How often have we heard that statement from our friends? I was just talking to him the other day, but now he's gone. Today I live, but tomorrow I may die and quickly forgotten. The old song says, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up beyond the blue. That's why Paul said, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul knew that this life is nothing compared to what Christ has promised to give us. David says in Psalm 39, Show me, O Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting is my life. You have made my days a mere handbreadth. The span of my years is as nothing before you. Each man's life is but a breath. Very short. For such a time as this, we are reminded my brothers and sisters in the Lord, we are reminded of our mortality, that our life is very short, no matter how much years we promised ourselves. We really cannot promise ourselves a long life. We must live each day as if it is our last, making the most of every opportunity to live for what is eternal. Second, Similar to Esther's day, our time is a time of grief and mourning. Our time today is a time of grief and mourning. Chapter 4, verse 1 and 3 capture it very clearly. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city wailing loudly and bitterly. Verse 3, in every province to which the edict and order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. They were all 
mourning the edict of the king that all Jews will die. In ancient times, to wear sackcloth and ashes is a way of expressing great sadness and grief, a way of expressing a, a broken heart for an impending suffering. My family and I had a, a very meaningful visit to Thailand a few years back before the, the pandemic. We were there for, uh, for five months on a, a mission trip. And during those months, uh, we met many people from, from different nationalities, both Thais and, and other uh, people from different countries. And uh, many of them were, were still young. And, and some were already advanced in, in years. And I've noticed that some old people I met are, are, are still looking vibrant, uh, while, while some young people I met were already weary uh, in life. And uh, listening to, to these uh, people, uh, I heard many stories of, of their lives. I heard uh, stories of, of victory and uh, success. I heard stories of failure, uh, stories of, of pursuing their dreams and careers. Um, about changing plans uh, in life. But the most common stories that I heard are stories of, of pain and, and suffering. These are the, the kind of, of stories that, that stick in our minds and hearts whenever we, we hear them. The kind of stories that are not easily forgotten. We only share them when we know someone is truly listening. We share them when the other person also knows our pain. Stories about losing a job, about depression and extreme sadness. Stories about an estranged family member, about broken marriages, about rejection, about losing a family member in death about pain and suffering, whether from others or our own doing. I also heard stories of addiction, which resulted to extreme uh, loneliness. I concluded that their pain is not different than our own. We're all the same. Beneath our, our friendly smiles and our courtesy to one another, most of us, we are in pain. We are all suffering, whether people see it or not. There are days when we are extremely happy, but those days are only very few. Most of the days we feel sadness in our hearts. We are weary and, and tired. Sometimes we ask ourselves, what is, what is wrong with me? What is wrong with me? I learned that we all have our own share of suffering. We all have our own stories of pain, like the story of Esther and Mordecai. In the classic movie, The, the Princess Bride, the pirate Robert said to Princess Buttercup, life is pain, your highness. Anyone who says differently is selling something. In other words, we are all broken people. We all mourn. And because of our brokenness, because of our pain and suffering, we cry to God in our prayers. We fully realize that life is painful. And we realize that we need God in the midst of our pain. We pray to God to, to take our pain away. But somehow, his answer is always, not yet, not yet. And the longer we wait, the more painful it gets. And so, we pray more. According to Matthew 5.3, we are all poor in spirit. The poor in spirit are those people who experience pain and suffering in this life. There are also those who realize that they need God most of all during their suffering. There are those who mourn, those who cry, 
those who need comforting, those who experience hunger and thirst, those who need mercy, those who are persecuted and insulted. Sounds very much like us. We are all poor in spirit. We are all broken people in the eyes of the Lord. And for such a time as this, we need compassion for one another. We need to acknowledge not only our own pain, but also acknowledge the pain of others. Like how Esther listened carefully to Mordecai's report. By simply listening to the sad stories of others, slowly we help them bring healing to their broken hearts. Thirdly, similar to Esther's day, our time calls for a time of prayer and self-denial. A time of prayer and self-denial. Esther chapter 4, verses 15 and 16 says, Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will fast as you do. In these verses, Esther called for a citywide prayer and fasting. In her hopelessness, Esther had no better option than to turn to God in prayer. She not only prayed, but she denied herself food and drink in fasting. Fasting is a form of, of self-denial, one of the ancient disciplines of the spiritual life. When we fast, we acknowledge that, that our spiritual life is more important than our physical life. When we fast, we acknowledge that, that the needs of our soul and not just the cravings of our stomach. Fasting can make our prayer more focused, more intimate, and more urgent to the God who listens to our prayers. During the COVID lockdown, my, my most intimate prayers happened when I sit in our school's empty chapel. The chapel used to be a place where the, the students and teachers meet during chapel hours. It used to be a place of loud music and uh, loud voices. But I discovered that the, the silence and, and solitude of an empty chapel is an intimate place for me to, to talk to my Lord. I also learned that I can hear the inner voice of God better when things are, are quiet. When I temporarily put aside my need for food, for entertainment, and for pleasure. But we should thank the Lord for our daily bread as well, for the food regularly served on our table. After all, it was God who created all the, the plants and animals, all the fish and the birds, and it is him that makes all of them grow to provide for our meat and vegetables. We should pray for our farmers who planted the crops and took care of the, the livestock, we pray for the vendors in the market who brought the produce near us and within our reach. But if we love to eat, we can thank the Lord for food by not eating too much. If you have not tried it, uh, fasting uh, is, is a good uh, thing to try. You know, it is also healthy to skip a meal. In fact, healthier than to always have a full stomach. To experience hunger once in a while can be good for us, for it reminds us that the true satisfaction of our deepest need is God, not food, not food. We also thank the Lord today for our modern technology, for the tools of communication we are using. The internet, the smartphones, the online shopping, the live video chats, these are, these are modern conveniences that, 
people in the Bible have never dreamed of. However, we must understand that the more advanced the technology, the greater its capacity for good and evil. The more high-tech the gadgets, the greater the addiction to those who use them. Today, we are reminded to use these modern tools in moderation. We can thank the Lord for our phones by uttering a silent prayer of thanks in, in secret, not by posting our prayers uh, for other people to see and like. Pray in secret, Jesus said, then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So, my brothers and sisters, for, for such a time as this, we are reminded like Esther that food, clothing, our outward appearances, our tools and gadgets are not the most important in our lives. For such a time as this, we learn that our time with the Lord in prayer is the most important. It is during our prayer time that our love for the Lord grows and outflows to others who also need his, his love. Fourth, similar to Esther's day, our time is a great opportunity and for sacrifice. A time of great opportunity and for sacrifice. Esther 4, 13 to 14, Mordecai said to Esther, do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. In other words, Mordecai presented to Esther two options to use her royal position to save only herself or to use her royal position to save many others. If Esther was selfish, she would have accepted the king's offer. She would have chosen to accept half of the Persian Empire all for herself. But instead, she chose to sacrifice herself for the sake of her people. She placed herself in great danger by approaching the king and pleaded for mercy. She knew that she will be in a life or death situation when she said her famous words, and if I perish, I perish. By doing this great sacrifice, we learn that the true beauty of Esther is not on her face, but in her heart. When she placed herself in great danger, she was being like Jesus Christ. Jesus and Esther both sacrificed themselves and both received honor from the king. Esther's great example had been followed by many Christians in the past. You probably heard of the story of, of Francis of Assisi who who would visit the house of lepers every day and give alms to them and kiss their infected hands. Or the story of, of Dietrich Bonhoeffer during the Second World War who continued to preach and serve Christ in, in Germany, risking his life against the Nazis. Every Christian, for every Christian, every crisis presents an opportunity to serve others. Paul reminds us in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Like Esther, we today also occupy a royal position in the kingdom of God. We are sons and daughters of the king. And in times like these, we have the option to just sit back and relax, satisfied that we have received eternal life from the Lord. Or we can grab this opportunity in, this, in these evil days 
to tell others of the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. You can ask ourselves, when was the last time that I shared my faith to an unbeliever? When was the last time that I really took the time to, to listen to someone who is in deep trouble? Friends, for, for such a time as this, we are called to love God and to love others despite the danger. Like Esther, we are called to express our love to God by serving others in sacrificial ways. And the last of our reflection is that similar to Esther's day, our time is a time of celebration. Time of celebration. The Jews celebrated because the king of Persia granted them the right to defend themselves against their enemies, if you read the, the book of Esther. Esther chapter 8, if we move forward to chapter 8, it says, the king's edict granted the Jews in every city the right to assemble and protect themselves, to destroy, kill, and annihilate any armed force of any nationality or province that might attack them and their women and children, and to plunder the property of their enemies. Even before the battle, they burst into joy and gladness for the second chance that was given them. And after winning a victory against their enemies, they celebrated even more. Esther 8, 15, and the city of Susa held a joyous celebration. For the Jews, it was a time of happiness and joy, gladness and honor. In every province and in every city, whether the edict of the king went, there was joy and gladness among the Jews with feasting and celebrating. Only a few of us have this kind of experience, my friends. You know, when, when someone experienced a, a near-death experience but came out alive, whether an accident or a, a life-changing illness, a life-threatening illness, lying on the hospital bed, when you were so sure that your time has come, but surprise, surprise, you came out alive. You were given a, a second chance in life. You suddenly realize that each minute is precious and should not be wasted. You suddenly tell yourself to live differently and focus on the things that are really important. Such was the experience of Esther and Mordecai and all the Jews in that time. That's why it's called for a, a celebration. They call it today the Feast of Purim. Purim is a, what meaning of Purim is, is the casting of lots, the, the, the way that Haman chose the day to destroy the, uh, the Jews. Uh, they still celebrate it today uh, on the first week of, of March in Israel. But what about us? What is our near-death experience? Well, our, as Christians, our experience is not only near death. In fact, we all died. We all died. In Colossians 3, 1 to 3, since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. We all died, but we were raised back to life, according to this verse. Our faith in Christ made us one with him in his death and resurrection. For us Christians, this means that every single day that we live is a second chance from God. Every day should be a joyful celebration, a chance to finally live for the Lord. We are no longer bound to serve our sinful appetites. We are no longer bound to live by the, by the vain standards of this world. Finally, we are free to live a life that is truly life. That's why Paul can declare, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live but Christ lives in me. The life 
I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. For such a time as this, my friends, we are called to celebrate the new life we have in Christ. This is why we gather every Sunday to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus and to celebrate our own spiritual rebirth as a community, our new life in Christ. That was how the church was actually born. On the third day after the crucifixion, the disciples heard rumors that Jesus was alive. They came together just to confirm it from one another. Is it true? Is it true that Jesus is alive? They came together, and then suddenly Jesus was with them and appeared to them, alive again. Their hearts were filled with such joy and gladness. They celebrated by worshiping the Lord. For such a time as this, we can be glad and joyful for a second chance to live a life of obedience to God. To end this message, my friends, I would like to point to you a, a, an interesting verse in Esther, uh, one that, would, that we should not miss. It's in uh, chapter 8, verse 17. And it says, And many people of other nationalities became Jews because fear of the Jews had seized them. To become a Jew does not mean to, to change uh, your nationality. No, just like to, to, to become an American from a, a Filipino. No. Uh, to become a Jew mainly means to, to embrace the, the faith of the Jews to, or to believe in the God of the Jews. So if you allow me to, to, to paraphrase this first, it would say that and many people of other nationalities believed in the Lord because fear of the Lord had seized them. And through this verse, we may know that God's name is mentioned in this book, after all. Today, as we celebrate our, our new life in, in Christ each Sunday, as a church, as a, as a Christian community, other people will see our faith and, and obedience to the Lord, and they will put their faith in Christ whom we serve. Let us continue to tell others the good news, that Jesus is alive and that we too can receive life in his name. A blessed Sunday to, to all of you. Thank you for, for listening. Shall we all rise and, and, and pray? Dear Lord, we, we honor you and we praise you, God, for your holy name. For you are the God who saves us. You are the God who, who saved your people from the great flood. You are the God who saved the Hebrews from Egypt. You are the God who saved the Jews in Persia. And today you are the God who saved us from our sin and from the fires of hell. Lord, we celebrate today the salvation we have in you, in your Son. Teach us and lead us to be like Mordecai and Esther in our time today. By your grace, Lord, may we live our remaining days knowing that you have placed us for such a time as this, that we may be your instruments of salvation, that others may know you and put their trust in you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen.